Well, Gene, are you still here? Yes, I'm. All righty. Well, looks like we got James and Anthony's. There may be somebody that pops in a few minutes late, but um, when you're ready, just move your cursor down to the bottom, click record, and tell it to record to the cloud, not to your or your computer. I already did. Awesome. Well, then we're recording. It's all yours, and I'll edit it later. Okay, uh, Anthony and James, can you see the uh, slide? It says Texas EMS jurisprudence. Okay, we got James Hale now. Okay, that's good. Welcome, James. Okay, good. Okay, well, this is a course that you're required to have. Um, and um, it's basically uh, two hours. I might be able to finish a little bit less than two hours. So if I can, we'll try to do that. But um, it's um, basically about the rules and regulations of EMS in Texas. And um, just a, a little bit of history about Texas EMS. Um, Texas is a rather unique state in the way EMS developed in the state. Uh, back in the 1970s, when people started having what we call EMS today, uh, rather than ambulance services, the um, Department of Health, um, TDH, Texas Department of Health, as it was called then, uh, had a voluntary program for uh, EMS. There was no legal um, statute. There, there was no law creating EMS in Texas. So legally, we didn't have it. Legally, there was no such thing as an EMT or an EMT intermediate or a paramedic or an, an ECA emergency care attendant, which is Texas's name for first responder. Um, and uh, the National Association of EMTs was, was really strong in Texas at that time. And, and, and we had chapters all over the state. And uh, we were pretty well organized on an ad hoc um, independent basis. And uh, the Department of Health um, devoted some manpower to it and they had an office in Austin. And um, one of the first things they did was uh, help develop protocols. And um, at that time, EMS was new. And, uh, you know, it was sort of every man for himself. We uh, really did not know uh, exactly what we were doing. We were just uh, feeling our way along as we, as we went. And, and because of that, we very quickly saw that in Texas, a unified system where you had state, a state medical director and state, uh, state um, protocols and uh, state mandated everything like they do in many other states would simply not work in Texas because it's too big and there's too many different regions, too many different geographical differences and population differences and the whole thing. And so it became uh, evident, uh, pretty clear uh, that the best thing to do was to allow every service to have its own medical director and allow that medical director to um, formulate the um, policies, procedures, protocols, and standing orders uh, that were going to be used. Uh, choose the drugs and devices to be used and the skills that could be done. Um, the state eventually did uh, promulgate the rules that do to some degree uh, establish minimums, but there are few, if any, maximums. The advantage of that is that um, the medical director, if he wants to make a change, uh, for example, uh, ketamine is a good, good example. Adding ketamine to the protocols out here in, in Arizona would be unheard of because it basically takes uh, the whole state deciding to do it uh, in order to get a state 
uh, wide change in the protocol, and you can't do it uh, individually. Uh, fentanyl was another one. Uh, in Arizona, even now, a lot of services can't carry fentanyl because you have to get a special dispensation in order to do it. Well, things like that don't happen in Texas. If a uh, medical director decides uh, she wants to add ketamine, then uh, it's done with a stroke of a pen. And uh, that just makes it a whole lot easier, and I think it makes for better, better practice. Um, I was involved in the uh, development of the uh, law and the rules. There were uh, ad hoc committees that, that were chosen a lot of us just simply volunteered because nobody else wanted to do it. You had to go to Austin uh, every three months and basically pay your own way, uh, stay in the hotel for a whole weekend and, and basically meet from uh, eight o'clock in the morning until five or six at, at night working on rules, which is not the most fun thing to do. But um, uh, the group of us, uh, we're from all around the state, and we had all kinds of different perspectives. And I think it took us about two, two and a half years, really, to draft the rules that ended up being what they are. And even the rules today, even though they've been tweaked and modified, are still based on those basic rules that we wrote back in the early 1980s. Um, so with that kind of background, um, We'll go ahead and um, start the um, uh, lecture. It's not a lecture, it's a chat. Um, successful completion of this presentation meets the DSHS um, jurisprudence education requirement. Um, you, um, we do not uh, issue blanket certificates to everybody who, who takes this. It goes on your transcript. If you, for example, and I say this because this is being recorded and other people will watch it. If you're from a state that uh, requires a certificate, um, we will print a certificate out for you. We just don't automatically print them for everybody because uh, it's, it's not necessary uh, for a lot of people. So if you, if you need a, a certificate, uh, just let us know and uh, we will send you one. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go through uh, the rules basically and explain the ones that you really need to know and where they are and, and how to find them. Um, this is nothing new. Everybody has to know the legal aspects of your practice. And um, this is not a comprehensive course by any means at all. Uh, it's just a very, very basic introduction to how the rules and regulations are structured and, and basically how they work. Um, the the uh, disciplinary actions website, for example, is shown here um, at the uh, bottom of the uh, uh, slide. And um, it's really easy to search for these uh, things because if you go into Google, and you just put it, you can't remember this uh, link, and you just put Texas EMS trauma systems, disciplinary actions, or just even Texas EMS discipline, it'll take you to the page that you need to go to. So it's, it's real easy to, uh, to find this stuff. If uh, there are a, a lot of things that um, you uh, can be disciplined for, a whole long list of things. And uh, some of the, the, the less obvious ones are that if your ambulance is involved in a collision of any kind, doesn't matter whether it's a fender bender or not, your service, not you, but your service must report the incident to the state. Um, you may not realize that um, you cannot run with a partner whose uh, state certification has expired. Um, you uh, could face disciplinary action yourself if you make calls with a non-certified individual, not to mention that your uh, service could lose its, uh, its certification. 
So um, keep that in mind. Make sure that you know uh, who you're running with and that they are up to date. Um, it is quite common for people to uh, forget to renew and let their uh, cert certifications lapse. And uh, I remember one service that Jane and I know well, where uh, all of a sudden one day they woke up and found out that, that they had a whole bunch of medics who were running around who had lapsed some of them months before. Um, so that creates a little bit of a problem when that happens. So don't, don't let that happen. Um, okay. Um, can you have a first responder bag that has IV fluids, catheters, and all that kind of stuff in it? The answer is yes, if your medical director has uh, certified it. Um, another question that comes up is whether or not you can practice under your medical director's um, license uh, outside of your own area in the state of Texas? The answer is it depends on your medical director. If he wants you to be able to practice under his uh, license, no, no problem, Alicia. Uh, if he wants you to practice under his uh, license, uh, he could do that, but then he's responsible for what you do. Um, I don't recommend that you go running about the state, uh, jumping calls and showing up on, uh, on scenes because uh, that will get you in trouble. Uh, but um, if, for example, your service decides that you should be um, available at all times and, and, and in, in a lot of rural volunteer services, that's the case, uh, it's not unusual for people to have a stocked bag, but it must be uh, inventoried and, and approved by the uh, medical director. And I would keep a, a statement in there with it uh, to that, uh, um, to, to prove that. I'm going to stop here just a second and write down the people who have joined. Okay, I've got everybody now. Um, so, um, any questions about that? All right. Uh, it is your responsibility to do uh, your own continuing education, including this course. It's not your provider's job to uh, make you do that or even to provide it for you, although many of them will. Uh, every provider, however, and when I say provider, that means the service, um, must keep documented records of uh, its personnel's jurisprudence examination compliance. Uh, as of September 1 last year, um, everybody uh, who works in EMS, everybody who is certified must have completed this course um, before their service provider's license renewal date. Now, what is not clear to me, and maybe Jane knows, is when you hire somebody new, let's say somebody comes from out of state, is there a time limit on how long uh, that person has to take the, uh, take the exam? Do you know, Jane? What do you mean about when you hire them and they're not state certified yet in Texas? Uh, yeah, well, they're state certified, but they came from a different state. and They've now done reciprocity. I guess they'd have to prove that they, they have to be certified in Texas okay. first before they can operate on an ambulance, even if yeah. they hold just a national registry, which is our entry level. Like, you know, you guys go out there and take the national registry test and you pass it. You're still not going to be authorized to function on the ambulance in a paramedic slot or as a anything other than in state certified EMT until you finish the process through Texas Department of State Health Services and gain that certification. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, um, the uh, Texas EMS Rules and Regulations website describes just about everything and um, it's easy to find just like I said. 
Um, the two uh, links at the bottom are for the statutes and the regulations. And let me just mention the difference between statute and regulation. The statute is passed by the legislature. The enabling statute is chapter 773 of the Texas Health and Services Code. And um, it uh, defines what an EMS service is, what EMS personnel are, uh, what a paramedic is, what an EMT is, what um, uh, and, and uh, intermediate is. Uh, Texas still calls us, I guess they call us um, EMT intermediates, although on the national level it's called advanced EMT, AEMT. Uh, we still call first responders, emergency care attendants, ECAs, um, whereas um, most other people call it uh, first responder. So, um, the statutes have to be amended by the legislature. They can't be changed except by act of the legislature. On the other hand, the rules are the rules that we operate under. And the rules are um, adopted by the Texas State Department of Health Services. And uh, they go through a rulemaking process, which basically is the process I was describing to you when we first wrote the rules. What happens is you draft uh, your uh, rules. Uh, usually they have committees that, that do that. And then when you decide on the wording, uh, they're published in the Texas Register, uh, which is the legal notification document that the state of Texas has that announces everything. They publish the rules in there. And then there's a comment period during which people can uh, make written comments about them. and um, you know, ask for clarification or changes or additions or whatever. Uh, and then basically there uh, is a hearing, a public hearing at which people can um, attend and stand up and talk and speak and, um, and express their uh, views. Eventually it goes to the State Board of Health who um, uh, decides what the rules will be. They, they adopt the rules and then, and then the rules go into what is called the Texas Administrative Code, the TAC. Now, uh, the, like I said, the statutes are in chapter 773 of the uh, health and uh, of the, the state uh, health code, um, whereas the um, regulations are in the Texas Administrative Code, which is a different set of books a different set of, uh, of data. And that is basically in chapter 157, 157. And um, if you go to that, let me see if I can, I guess the link is not gonna work. Um, okay, anyway, you can go to it and you scroll down the rules. And for example, if you want to know about disciplinary proceedings, um, it, it has a whole list of the things that you could be disciplined for. An example would be abandoning a patient. And um, abandonment is leaving a patient uh, without appropriate medical care. Once care has been established, unless you're following the medical director's protocols, uh, a physician directive or the patient signs a release or turning the care of a patient over to an individual of less education when an advanced treatment modality has been initiated. So for example, you uh, start an IV on the patient, you cannot now turn that patient over to an ECA to um, care for on the trip to the hospital. Uh, if you started the IV, uh, the patient's yours. Um, however, if, um, for example, your patient uh, broke his arm and uh, you applied a splint uh, <laughs> to the patient, uh, then uh, there is no further need for uh, a paramedic, for example, to ride that patient in. So you could turn that patient over to an ECA or a basic EMT. Um, if, um, if you started a drip on the patient, let's say you started a, uh, uh, an epi drip, 
Um, even though EMT intermediates or AEMTs can start IVs, they are not certified to run drips. So you could not turn that patient over to an AEMT. You're, you're chained to that patient as long as, as the drip is running. However, if the drip is discontinued and only uh, a line is running TKO or you're even giving fluids, that's within the uh, scope of practice of an AEMT. And so you could turn care of the patient over uh, to an AEMT. So it all depends upon what the patient's needs are. You can't uh, turn the patient over to someone who is incapable of providing the care that has been begun or the care that the patient needs. Uh, however, if the person you're turning it over to is perfectly capable of meeting the patient's needs, then you may do so. Any questions? Okay, now the, um, the statutes and regulations define the levels of trauma centers. And I think we all pretty much know what the levels are, level one through four. Uh, level one trauma center is the teaching facility, the university medical center. Uh, it has to have uh, basically all specialties available in-house 24 hours a day or else on 30 minute uh, call. A level two uh, is just about the same, except that a level one basically is a teaching hospital and has medical students and residents, resident physicians uh, in-house on a continuing basis, whereas a, a level two may not uh, do that, but it still must have the specialties. A level three um, does not have to have all specialties and it does not to have, have to have uh, people in-house, but for example, it has to have uh, general surgeons on 30-minute uh, response, for example. Um, a level three is able to take care of most patients, um, but a lot of it depends upon the way the system is set up. There are no hard and fast rules about what level you need to transport to. You need to transport the patient to the facility that can take care of the patient's needs best. That may mean bypassing a level three and going to the level one that's 15 miles further away if that's the, the best place for the patient to be. So it depends upon what, what's best for the patient and what, what the facility can provide. Um, also, you have to know how your system is organized. For example, uh, here in Tucson, Arizona, where I live, we have one level one hospital. That's uh, University Medical Center. It's uh, part of the, of the uh, Banner Hospital System and also part of the University of Arizona. It's the medical school. Um, by local rule, it gets all trauma patients doesn't matter whether the trauma is a hangnail or a, uh, uh, a broken neck uh, or a mashed finger or a gunshot to the chest, all trauma goes to the level one. Um, cardiacs, however, may go to any of the other hospitals that have a cath lab. And just about all the level threes and the one level two do have cath labs. Uh, how about stroke patients? They are all stroke designated hospitals. And so uh, you could take your stroke uh, patient to any one of those. Uh, in Texas, um, I am not aware of, um, you know, what every population center's rules are, but uh, you may find that by local convention, for example, uh, you take this type of patient to that center, you take that type of patient to another center. In Tyler, Texas, for example, where Jane and I both used to teach, uh, they have a level one and a block down the street is a level two. Uh, by convention, the level two is uh, pretty much the heart hospital. The level one is pretty much the trauma hospital, although there are va variations on that. So, um, 
a lot of this doesn't have to do with statutes and regulations so much as it does with local agreements and conventions and always standard of care. Now, the statutes and the regulations don't say much of anything about standard of care. That's civil law. That is uh, tort law. Uh, you still have to uh, understand um, tort law. Abandonment, for example, is a tort concept. It's not a, uh, not a legislated concept. It's not a law. It's a, it's, it's a, a, a legal concept from the common law. So um, you must not only know the rules and regulations, which deal with the kinds of things we're talking about here, but you have to also understand what the civil law uh, aspects of what you do are. Uh, so you can be both liable for, uh, for criminal and civil sanctions depending upon upon what you do but the criminal sanctions must come from the statutes and regulations we do not have civil uh, court-made criminal uh, statutes but we do have uh, liability now um under 157.2, remember, 157 is the regulations, uh, not the statute. Of to be a volunteer, there, there are uh, times when the definition of being a volunteer is important. Um, a volunteer organization, for example, has to be three quarters volunteer, which means that it cannot be made up of more than 25% paid staff. Now, there are many, many volunteer organizations that are part paid and part volunteer. So that means you have a paid staff that uh, uh, live in house and respond from the station, um, whereas you may have um, volunteers that respond from home. So, um, in order to remain a volunteer provider and, and re retain nonprofit status, the organization must have 75% volunteers and no more than 25% paid staff. Um, in Texas, every level of ENT certification practices under the medical supervision of a Texas licensed physician, which means either an MD or a DO. DOs and MDs are equal under uh, the Texas law. So it doesn't matter whether your, your doctor is an osteopath or um, uh, an MD. And uh, they are both governed by the Texas Medical Board, not the Department of Health. Texas Medical Board is a separate uh, entity, just like the Texas Nursing Board is a separate entity. We ought to have, and this is opinion now, we ought to have um, a separate entity for EMS, I think, and it should be out from under the Board of Health, but that will probably never happen. Um, a physician cannot delegate to a nurse, PA, or a division chief, or somebody like that to provide medical supervision and direction. However, simply sitting at a desk and reading protocols to uh, over the phone or radio does not constitute medical supervision. There are some services, very few now, but there are still some services or what we used to call mother may I systems where before you did anything, you had to call for um, approval from online medical control. And for example, <clears throat> when I went to paramedic school in Houston, <coughs> Houston Fire had a Mother May I system, but it was manned by paramedics in the communication center at Ben Taub Hospital. And all they would do is just simply read the, uh, the protocols. So that is not what we mean by medical direction. Uh, medical direction is where something is ordered that is off the protocols and, um, you know, purely within the physician's purview. 
So that part cannot be delegated. And uh, you have to talk to a doctor in order to have uh, medical direction for doing something that is uh, not in a, in a standing order, a written standing order. Um, what is response ready? Um, response ready means you're fully staffed, fully equipped, and can immediately respond 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, if you are still uh, uh, checking out your unit in, in the morning and um, you haven't figured out yet whether or not you have enough oxygen and whether you're going to have to change out the uh, cylinders, you are not response ready. Now, uh, let me give you an example of um, what can happen. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Um, one example was uh, happened up in Oklahoma. They get a call for a cardiac arrest. They get there and they can't find the monitor and defibrillator. The reason they can't find the monitor and defibrillator is that the supervisor took it out to do something with it and forgot to put it back in the ambulance. They didn't check out their ambulance uh, before they uh, declared uh, response ready. And so they got there and they had no way to defibrillate this patient. Um, so uh, that got them a big lawsuit because the patient died. Um, another example, this was a case I worked on in uh, Chicago against Chicago Fire Department. Um, a guy has a cardiac arrest and um, engine company shows up <laughs> and uh, they put their monitor on him and he's in V-fib. They attempt to charge the monitor and it, uh, the, def the defibrillator and it will not charge. And uh, so uh, they change out the batteries and uh, it still will not charge. So they call for backup and um, send another, another uh, truck and it gets there and guess what? It's defibrillator will not charge either. Um, patient dies, big lawsuit. It turns out that they were not complying with the uh, manufacturer's rules about uh, recycling batteries. And uh, what was happening is that um, people were uh, going to the logistics uh, place and picking up what they thought were uh, reconditioned batteries, when in fact they were the same old batteries that had been turned in. Uh, they kept no records of uh, the, uh, the identities of the batteries or when they had last been reconditioned. Uh, <clears throat> because of that, um, some people lost their jobs, including a deputy chief, and um, they paid a lot of money a lot of money <laughs> in damages in, in, in settlement to the family of the uh, person who, who died. So um, obviously they had not um, checked out their uh, monitor and defibrillator uh, that day. So um, you must be sure that you're response ready because if you, if you don't, there are both criminal and civil uh, remedies. You could lose your certif certification, the service can lose its license, and uh, you can be held liable in uh, civil damages if uh, somebody gets hurt as a result of that. Matt, you gotta make sure that the unit will start and run. Okay, now, some things that you may not be aware of. Every service must have an administrator of record. And uh, this is the administrative point of contact for the provider. And uh, this is the person who talks to the Department of Health, State Health Services when they come by, et cetera, and, and so forth. They have to be knowledgeable about uh, the rules that govern EMS and uh, what's required for continuing education. And, and here's the interesting thing, that may not be employed by two agencies to do the same thing. They might not be employed or otherwise compensated by another private for-profit EMS provider. The reason for this rule is that in Texas, just about anybody can start up an EMS services. 
uh, service. In Harris County, which is Houston, I don't know how many there are now. At one time, there was like 400 ambulance services running around. And uh, a lot of them uh, were, were owned by the same people and operated under different names. They would use the same medical director. They would use the same uh, administrator of record. Uh, I know one time they discovered that there was some doctor who had 92 different services that he was supposed to be medical director for. So rules like this were passed to stop that from happening. And um, so uh, that's a minor thing to remember for, for EMTs and paramedics, but um, you certainly probably don't want to work for a service that is not in compliance because if they're not in compliance in one way, they're probably not in compliance in other ways. Quality management simply means that you've got to have a quality assurance, quality improvement program. Um, 157.3 talks about provider licenses and applications, and it, it defines what you have to do to become a um, certified EMS provider in the state of Texas one of the four levels, gives you the rules. It also talks about if disciplinary action is taken against you, uh, how you can appeal your, um, the determination. And I would say this to you, that if you get a notice that you've been suspended, you've got 15 days in order to um, ask for a hearing. Um, so you can't, uh, just sit around and, and uh, hope things will go away. You have, to, you have to appeal within a relatively short period of time or file your appeal. Audits can be done by uh, the state um, Department of State Health Services. You can be audited personally to see if your uh, continuing education is on the up and up and the service can be audited. And this can happen at any time of the day or night, and uh, you cannot deny the state representative access to your premises or your records. They have the absolute right to uh, inspect everything. They do um, audit randomly, although not so much anymore because they are so busy. They're, they, uh, they do follow up on uh, complaints that are made, and um, that pretty much takes up their time. Um, in order to be a provider, you have to uh, submit an application and, and pay a fee, and, and the rule 157.11 describes all of that. And it's a, an extensive list that um, it requires identifying who the actual owners are. For example, you can't use a Caribbean Shell Corporation to set up an ambulance service in the state of Texas, which some people have tried to do. Um, you've got to, you have to say who you really are. And uh, it also um, has to... Uh, it also tells you what the training and additional continuing education requirements for the administrator of record are. So all of those things have to be complied to, uh, complied with. It takes quite a bit of time to, to get that done. You can't just go out and fill out the uh, application and pay your fee and tomorrow you go into business. It doesn't work that way. Um, Okay, we talked about the administrator of record uh, has to be a certified EMT or above, has to have a criminal history check, and um, has to have approved uh, an initial education course uh, approved by DISHES, DSHS, and uh, earned eight hours of CE uh, related to state and federal rules and regulations that apply to uh, EMS. And, and what other, other, uh, other topics that uh, the department decides. EMS vehicles and staff also are under that rule. 
and it basically says what you can use for an ambulance. Um, you cannot go out and buy an SUV and uh, stick a stretcher in the back of it and make it an ambulance. Um, now, back in the old days, uh, when I started, they used station wagons for ambulances, and uh, they were a little more than horizontal taxis. Um, but uh, today, um, the um, ambulances have to meet the federal requirements, and uh, they also, and this is uh, the, the thing to look out for on a question, they have to display the name of the service on the vehicle, and I believe also the license number, uh, uh, not, the, not the vehicle license number, but the, uh, the provider license number on the vehicle it has to be prominently displayed. Um, there are different levels of ambulance all the way from basic, all the way up to MICU and critical care ambulance. Um, the um, minimum staffing for an ambulance in Texas is two emergency care attendants. Um, and that is okay for a, um, a basic level unit. So you can have two ECA staffing an active basic level ambulance. One does not have to be an EMT for this designation. Although outside of rural areas with volunteer systems, you probably don't see that happening much, but that was written for the, the, those areas of Texas where there are more tumbleweeds than people. Um, how about a, a BLS with ALS capabilities? That means that you carry ALS stuff like uh, IV fluids and catheters and intubation equipment on the unit, but um, unless you have an AEMT or EMT intermediate on there or paramedic on there, uh, it cannot be operated as an ALS unit. So it can revert to a BLS um, unit with ALS capabilities if it is operating as a BLS unit. None of the ALS stuff can be used, and two ECAs will fulfill the requirement, but um, it cannot operate above the BLS level. If uh, you are using, uh, if you're operating it as an active ALS unit then it has to have an EMT and an AEMT, okay? No ECAs. Question always comes up, well, can you have an ECA driver? Sure you can, so long as you have a, an EMT and an EMT intermediate or AEMT uh, in the back, you'd have a three-person a three unit. Um, and in, in, in places, uh, with volunteers, a lot of times that's what happens. Um, you got two, uh, you got the EMT and the AEMT in the back and the ECA driving. That's okay, but you cannot have an ALS unit and have the EMT drive and the AEMT, uh, or I mean, have the have the ECA drive and and AEMT in the back. That won't work. You've got to have an EMT and an intermediate. If you're operating at the MICU level, both an, a paramedic and an EMT must be on the ambulance. Uh, if it is uh, designated solely as a MICU, not a basic level with MICU capabilities, that's a difference, it must have a paramedic and at least an EMT to be response ready. It can't drop down to a BLS unit if its designation is strictly MICU. So that means that if all you have that day are two EMTs, you cannot operate that truck if it's designated as an MICU because the public has a right to uh, rely on what you say you are. If it says it's an MICU, it has to be uh, MICU capable. Okay, um, 
all protocols have to be signed by the medical director and they have to have an effective date. Then you have to have protocols for adults, pediatrics, and neonates, and also for every level of certification that will be staffing the ambulance. And I'm sure you, you've all seen the protocols where they're color coded according to EMT, uh, AEMT, and and paramedic as to what each can do. Protocols have to also adduce, uh, address the use of specialized equipment or pharmaceuticals, which means that if you're going to carry uh, a McGrath uh, uh, video laryngoscope on the truck, it has to be mentioned in the equipment list and you also have to include protocols for its use. And um, if you're going to carry a weird drug uh, on there, for example, your medical director decides he wants you to carry Milrinon on there, which is a cardiac drug, uh, that's got to be written in there. You can't just put, put it on there one day and, and it's it's there. It all has to be in the protocols and go along with the delegated scope of practice. You can't put a drug on there uh, that is uh, on a basic truck, for example, that is not authorized for basic EMTs to use. Now, there are a number of drugs in Texas that basic EMTs can give, uh, including albuterol, nitroglycerin, aspirin, etc. Uh, Epi 1 to 1000, but uh, you cannot put Levifed or dopamine or anything like that on there that, that an EMT uh, could not use if it is only certified as a basic level ambulance. Um, now, uh, the equipment list basically is, is a minimum list. Um, you do have to have a minimum of certain pieces of equipment and, um, and drugs. <laughs> you, you may find this uh, to be funny. Uh, when I started, I started back in the 1970s, and um, the equipment that was required on an ambulance was, quote, a first aid kit, unquote, and a traction splint. Now, why they picked a traction splint instead of other things, who knows? At, at no point did it say that anyone had to uh, know how to apply a traction splint. <laughs> you just had to have one on the truck. So I remember that it was kept under the floorboard of the <laughs> ambulance and uh, nobody ever, ever used it, which turns out to be a good thing because traction splints are useless, as we now know. Well, some people now know. Other people are still living in the past. All right. Uh, commercial tourniquets and splints, airway and patient assessment equipment. If you're running a, an MICU, you've got to have a monitor and defibrillator. It has to be a 12 lead. All durable equipment must have identifiable or legible serial numbers, and those have to be recorded by the service. Now, Remember my story about the batteries that were uh, not kept up with? Um, one of the reasons for rules like this is that people did things like that in the, in the past. So uh, everything has to be recorded and uh, that includes when it was purchased, uh, when maintenance was done, you have to keep maintenance records on it. Even if not required by, by the state rule, because of civil law rules, you had better keep maintenance records because if a piece of equipment goes bad on you and malfunctions uh, and the patient suffers damages as a result of that, that may be called into question and you may be asked under oath to describe your um, maintenance uh, activities and uh, including when maintenance was done, what type of maintenance was done, who did it, and you better have records of that. Uh, all equipment that is powered must have mechanical 
backup, manual mechanical backup, if possible, spare batteries uh, and an alternative power source as applicable. Now then, um, every ambulance has to at least be a BLS unit as far as equipment and, and uh, supplies. However, as you go up with higher uh, designations, you add equipment. So some of the additions to the list now in Texas, you must have waveform capnography or state approved CO2 detection equipment. Um, and that came into uh, play on January 1 of this year. And that it, and these must be used when performing or monitoring endotracheal intubation. Now, I know that some people will intubate and will not put the CO2 sensor on the tube because it is too much trouble for them and they are too lazy. Uh, that is the only reason for not doing that. And I will say to you that if you do that and your, and your tube was in the esophagus and you didn't realize it, you will be found liable for gross negligence, you will lose your certification, your service may lose its license, and it would not be unheard of for uh, you to be indicted for some degree of manslaughter. They have done that in uh, California and Michigan, as I recall, and maybe in some other places. So um, this is now required by, by law that you, it doesn't say you have to use it. It says that you have to have it, but if you don't use it, you're gonna be liable civilly, okay? And if gross negligence can get you a manslaughter or negligent homicide uh, indictment, okay? Cardiac monitors and uh, defibrillators have to be 12 lead. And um, that, that's starting January 1 of 2020. Oh, and they have to be able to transmit 12 league capability. Now, um, in years past, this was a problem because of the problems with radio transmission. Today, uh, the devices we have, uh, you know, we transmit everything over the internet. So this should not be a problem. Uh, not everybody transmits, and uh, most of the time it's not necessary. In some systems, they insist on it. In other systems, they rely on the medics to interpret most things. Um, quality and, and uh, assessment improvement uh, has to include um, monitoring uh, the quality of patient care and immediate and appropriate corrective action. And uh, the standards of care have to be um, signed by the medical director and in the approved protocols. Okay. Um, I thought there was a slide that covered this, and I, there, there may be, but I just want to bring this up. Uh, when we were talking about, the, uh, about being audited, uh, when the state visits you, <laughs> Every ambulance must have all of the equipment in it on its own. Now, in the old days, what some services would do, they didn't have enough equipment. And so here would come the state guy, and it would be somebody's job to try to distract him. You know, when he finished with one, one truck, they'd say, oh, well, let's take a break and go have some coffee. Um, uh, Grandma just baked a a new chocolate cake. I know you'll love having a piece of that. Get the guy inside so they can frantically change the equipment from <laughs> the, the ambulance he just inspected into the one he's about to inspect. That was done uh, more times than one. So um, just keep in mind that you cannot do that and keep both trucks in service. 
it's fine if you take equipment out of one truck and put it in another, but if it's required equipment, that other truck that you took it out of goes down. It can't be response ready. Um, you have to have a preventive maintenance plan for vehicles and equipment. We mentioned that. You have to be sure that all personnel are currently certified and licensed. Uh, patient care records have to be kept for at least seven years. Now, if the patient was a minor, you have to keep it at least until the patient reaches 21 years of age. So if the patient was one year old when you um, had that patient, you have to keep that record for 20 years, at least 21. Uh, I recommend that since we have the capability now of digital storage, that records never be dumped, that you keep the records forever, uh, because it can easily be done now. In the past, we had problems with it because we had tons and tons and tons of paper records. But uh, I worked on a case where uh, somebody sued the uh, hospital I was on the board of um, for a, um, an injury that happened during delivery. And uh, she was, um, I think she was 18 or 19 when she sued. And uh, we had to go uh, into the storage warehouse and, and find those records, which we did. Hospitals still had them. Um, if they hadn't been there, we'd have been in a whole lot of trouble because we had no uh, way of proving that uh, we were, had, had not made a mistake. So you gotta, you gotta keep the records. Uh, if, the, if you sell the business, the records go with it. Requirement is still uh, in effect. If you close down your service, you must maintain the records. And the uh, keeping the records until uh, they're 21, um, that is common, that, well, that is, Texas law, um, but it's also tort law just about everywhere. I don't think you will find any states that probably are different, but uh, you may even find places where they say 21 plus seven years on, on the theory that um, they had until they were 21 to discover the process, and then they have the statute of limitations on top of that. Statute of limitations in Texas is two years, unless you're a minor. Well, some people will argue that it doesn't start to run until you're 21. So I would recommend, if I was, if I was a lawyer, I would recommend that they keep, keep them for 28 years uh, or forever. Now, um, the EMS provider, um, you must be identified by your last name and first initial. Uh, and the level of certification that you have and your provider's name. This can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, the patch on your sleeve says what level of certification you are. But it is not required by law that you wear a patch on your sleeve. You can, for example, use a name tag. You can have a name tag that has your name, uh, level of certification, your picture, uh, which is not required, by the way. You're not required to, to wear a picture. Uh, and the EMS provider's name. Um, I have a problem with um, ID cards that clip on like that because of infection control. They are vectors for, um, for infections. And um, you pass, uh, we very seldom disinfect those things. And uh, they basically have whatever every patient you touched has on them. So um, 
to me, it's better to have embroidered names on shirts. So you have your last name and, and your level of certification and the provider's name on your, on your shirt, and that's washable. But there's, that's not required by law. All that's required by law is that you have the name, first initial, license or certification level, and the EMS provider's name, however you determine to do that. Um, okay, how does the state handle a complaint against uh, a service? Well, this rule 157.16 basically describes that. And it's way, way, way too long and too boring. Um, I don't intend to recite it for you, but now that you know how to access it, you can easily go in there. All you need to do is, is put in TAC 157.16 into Google and uh, you'll get it. It's that easy. All right, now, you can be suspended either on a non-emergency or emergency level. If the, the um, department decides that you're a, an immediate threat to mankind, <laughs> they may suspend you immediately. And you can be notified of that by a phone call. Um, so uh, if that happens, it, it doesn't matter whether you appeal it or not, you are effectively suspended the minute they do it, whether you know it or not. So um, return, you know, listen to your voicemail <laughs> is my recommendation. Because if they called you and left a voicemail saying you were immediately suspended as of this minute on this day, and you don't listen to the voicemail, and you go out on the ambulance, you have violated the law, whether you knew it or not. Uh, you can be uh, suspended um, on a non-emergency basis, in which case you get the nice letter from the uh, department. Now, some of the things that you can be um, suspended for are falsifying documents or licenses, posing as, a, as a, an EMT when you're not posing as a paramedic, when you're only an EMT, unfortunately, this happens um, more often than we'd like to think. Um, failure to maintain patient confidentiality. Uh, I knew of a, <clears throat> of a medic who got into trouble one time because she took a picture of the patient, uh, and it was a, a, a pretty, pretty bad trauma picture, and she posted it on the internet. That's a violation of HIPAA and also a violation of this, this regulation. And um, fortunately, she didn't lose her certification, but she almost did. She got put on probation. Um, allowing vehicle operation um, that's inappropriate, for example, running, running about with the lights and siren on when you're not on a, an emergency call. Um, I knew some people who uh, got into trouble for that because they thought it would be fun when they were sitting at the drive through at McDonald's to hit the siren and uh, scare everybody. Um, one, they almost got fired and they almost lost their certifications over that. So think twice before you pull some prank like that. Um, Operating or allowing anybody to operate the, the vehicle that is not clean, safe, in, in good operating uh, condition. One of the things that we have a lot of trouble with is infection control. Uh, it's difficult to do. It takes time. It has to be done meticulously, and it's not something we enjoy doing. But um, you can lose your... Um, certification for operating in an unsafe en environment. Um, more likely, the service would lose its certification for operating, for allowing the operation of ambulances that were not in, in good operating condition. 
Um, I worked on a case where they had a cardiac arrest and it was uh, about uh, this time of night. It was dark outside and when they went out to, to transport, they decided to transport. This is back in the days when we transported everybody with CPR or not. And uh, the lights wouldn't work on the ambulance. And uh, obviously a, a fuse had blown. Um, the guy who was driving, an EMT, had no idea uh, where uh, spare fuses were kept or that there were any. In fact, there were not. So they had no lights on the ambulance except that the strobes would work. <laughs> so he decides that um, he can see well enough to drive with just the strobes. So here they are going down the interstate and he testified that he was driving as fast as it would go, which is in excess of 80 miles an hour uh, without headlights at night. Um, that person is no longer an EMT and that service is no longer an EMS service. Um, they can deny you a license to operate a service for a number of different reasons. If you are convicted of certain misdemeanors or felonies, they may um, deny you a license, particularly if it involves drugs and narcotics. Um, but anything, for example, if you've got a domestic violence conviction, you're not gonna get a, a license to operate an ambulance service in Texas, and you're probably not gonna get Get, an EM, get to be an EMT or a paramedic either. You have to be 18 in order to be uh, an EMT uh, or uh, of any level in Texas. Um, you have to um, have at least a high school diploma or GED unless you are a high school student getting an ECA certification for exclusive use as a volunteer with a licensed provider or registered first responder organization. There are some high school programs that uh, have EMT courses and uh, you can't, they can't sit for the EMT exam, but they can uh, get an ECA to use strictly as a volunteer for a designated service. Uh, all EMS education has to be obtained through a DSH approved course, obviously. Um, national certification. In Texas, you must have your national registry before you can certify as uh, an EMT or paramedic in Texas. However, your national registry is not Texas certification. It does not allow you to practice in Texas. You get your national registry first and then you apply for your Texas certification. You do not have to take another exam. You do have to fill out the application and swear that you're not a child molester, for example, and uh, you have to pay the fee. The most important thing to them being the payment of the fee. Um, you will find as you get into this business that every time you turn around, you're paying a fee to somebody for something. Uh, the time period you have, um, two years from the time you complete your course to um, apply for certification. And uh, if you let two years pass before you uh, apply, you have to take another initial course. You have to take it over again. You have to keep your national registry certification current until the final requirement for initial state certification has been met. After that, you're not required to maintain your national registry. but you can't be certified initially unless you have national registry. Reciprocity, Texas is very generous in granting reciprocity to out-of-state people uh, who have a national registry certification. Other states are not equally nice. Uh, when I came to Arizona, it didn't matter that I was nationally registered. They still made me take uh, <laughs> the refresher course even though I had just finished teaching a refresher course two weeks before. Uh, so you will encounter some absurdities like that. And of course, the reason is, uh, again, money. 
so um There is no reciprocity at the ECA level because other states don't have ECA. Texas is the only state that has what is called an emergency care attendant. Um, and so um, it's not, it's not um, possible to, to get reciprocity and, and enter as an ECA. Responsibilities, uh, documentation. Um, you're required to document every patient um, encounter and you're required to leave your patient care report uh, with the hospital uh, or present it there within 24 hours or the next business day after the event. Um, now then, um, what we do usually in Texas is we have um, a sh what we call a short report that basically is the one you hand the um, EMS, uh, uh, the ER people, you, you hand this to the nurse. Um, it basically has the patient's name, contact information, vital signs, chief complaint, uh, the things you did, uh, for the patient in route and the patient's condition on arrival. Uh, you are not required to sit there and complete your entire report, particularly if you have calls waiting or if like in many rural areas, you're 50 miles from the hospital, you're the only, uh, you're the only 10 eight unit in your county and there you are out of the county 50 miles, you need to get started back um, so what you do is you drop off the abbreviated report and then you, uh, transmit electronically your finished report as soon as you finish, but you must do that within 24 hours. You get four years certification in Texas for ECA, EMT, AEMT, and paramedic. You get two years for, um, coordinator and then you have to renew. Um, you may uh, receive a notice from the state. I don't think so. Uh, I haven't received a notice from the state for the last three or four times. I don't think they do that anymore. It's your responsibility to uh, know that you're expiring and to, um, to uh, apply for um, recertification in plenty of time, because if you run out, even if you have applied, you let's say you run out on uh, March the 31st and you applied on January the 1st and they still haven't done it by March 31st, you are out. You can't operate until you get your renewal. So don't let that happen to you. You can apply as long as a year ahead of time, and as slow as they are, uh, I would say at least six months out, you need to uh, find your application for renewal. And then you'll be safe. Okay, I believe we covered that. If you're military uh, and you're deployed, um, they have different rooms. And the best thing to do is to is to talk to uh, the your uh, administrative uh, person about that. They should should know, or you can call the regional office of the of DSHS, and and they can figure that out for you. There are five different ways to recertify. One is by taking the national registry exam. Two is by keeping up with your continuing ed. Three is by uh, maintaining a current National Registry certification, or you can take a formal recertification course, which is a 48 hour course, or you can enroll and complete a state approved comprehensive clinical management program. This is a new program that um, <clears throat> hardly anybody knows anything about. Um, and um, Basically, it's 
very similar to something that the National Registry has that you're going to have to uh, uh, comply with if you recertify as a paramedic for National Registry. And it's basically a, uh, a, a program that has categories of of courses that you have to take and, and topics that you have to cover. Uh, okay, uh, we covered this. Uh, your certification has expired. Uh, you are not certified until recertification is issued and you must not function. Now, if you are not working, for example, and you let it expire, and then you decide you want to renew, if you filed your application to renew, within 90 days from the time you expire, you gotta pay one and a half times the normal renewal fee, and you have to verify your skills proficiency from an approved education program, which means you're gonna to have to come and, and pay a program to check you off. Uh, if you are more than 90 days out, but less than a year, your renewal fee doubles and you have to do skills verification also. Um, now, uh, criteria for denial and disciplinary actions um, and voluntary surrender. You can give up your license for example, uh, rather than be disciplined. So you think they've got you and uh, you're gonna lose it, you can give it up. So um, also uh, disciplinary action can range from suspension to probation uh, to um, surrender of your certification or license. State is good at working with you <coughs> if you simply made a mistake. However, that mistake should not be killing a patient. Um, if you commit a uh, violation of standard of care that results in somebody dying or, or suffering severe uh, injury or uh, worsening of their condition, uh, you may find that uh, the best you can do is take a new course and seek recertification uh, and, the, and even then you may not uh, you may not get it back um, the kinds of things that will get you um, put on suspension or getting a, a DWI for example um, uh, or getting convicted of some minor uh, thing you get into a little bar fight and you end up being arrested for assault and um, it's, it's more than a class C misdemeanor and so you have to list it. Uh, they can uh, deny you recertification. Um, generally they don't, they might put you under suspension. Uh, here's an example of what somebody did, somebody that I know, uh, they were having a party. As a matter of fact, it was New Year's Eve party and everybody was drinking and they had somebody that got really drunk and was throwing up and all this kind of stuff and so they just happened to have a bag of ringers and they just happened to have a catheter and so one of the paramedics started um, a line on this other person and somebody snitched and uh, <clears throat> two people ended up going on two years probation of a suspended uh, license for that. And uh, that's all that happened to them. They got through the probationary period uh, without, without a problem, but it, it got their attention. So don't do things like that. Um, at one point when there were a lot of rave parties, you know what a rave is, R-A-V-E, um, where a, a lot of ecstasy is being passed out ecstasy makes everybody have dry mouth and in some and it also makes them hyperthermic and so a lot of places would hire off-duty EMTs to be in what they call a cool room and they would uh, start cold IVs on on people using saline or ringers and uh, uh, if you got caught doing that you'd basically probably 
probably lose your license or, or, or certification or at least be suspended for a period of time where you couldn't work. So um, those are the kinds of things. If you read the rule, it, it, it specifies a whole list of things and then it's got this trash basket rule that basically is anything they can think of. So um, it, it's, it, you know, it's interesting. It's worth going there and reading. Uh, of course, anything that happens that's a felony or what they call a misdemeanor of moral turpitude, which means that you're morally corrupt, uh, murder, assault, rape, um, child uh, abuse, any of those things would be crimes of moral turpitude, burglary. Um, do not falsify, cheat, deceive, or discriminate. Um, alternative facts have no place in EMS. Uh, there are only the facts. Truth is the truth, whatever it may be. You must be able to write a timely, complete patient care report, regardless of whether it's a transport or refusal. And uh, that's got to, at minimum, have the patient's condition on arrival, what you did, what happened to the patient during transport, uh, a list of signs, symptoms, and responses to your efforts, and um, everything else that completes the uh, report. I will say this, that from a legal point of view, and I'm talking about civil law now, being sued, you live or die by your documentation. And um, do not document things that are just conclusions, for example. Document facts. I'll give you an example of the difference between a fact and a conclusion. If you document patient on a right, if you, well, let's just put it this way. Here's what you write. O slash A, PT period, A and A and O, X, four. You all know what that means. On arrival, the patient was awake and alert and uh, oriented to time, place, person, and event. But those are all conclusions. That's your conclusion upon looking at the patient. You don't say a thing about what the patient did to allow you to draw that conclusion. And uh, if you only document that, and it turns out that, uh, for example, the patient was not awake and alert <laughs> or, or was confused or uh, didn't have the present mental capacity to um, know what they were doing when they refused, then the lawyers will rip you a new one because they will show that uh, you did not document the patient's actual condition. So your observation that of A and A and O times four is your conclusion. You've got to put down the facts so that anybody reading those facts can draw their own conclusion as to whether or not the patient was awake and alert. And so the way you do that is you document, patient stated his name is John Smith, correctly, that today's date is May 18, 19, uh, 2018, um, that it is uh, around uh, 21, 24 hours in the evening, that the um, patient is located in his house at 2141 Wistful Vista Avenue in Anytown, USA, and that uh, he relates that as he was getting out of the shower, he slipped and fell and thinks he may have broken his wrist, period. Now, you have painted a picture of that patient that allows anyone reading that to say, okay, this guy knew who he was, where he was, when it was, and he said what happened. Those are facts, but A and A and O times four is a conclusion. So 
Don't fall into that trap. Now, that kind of a mistake doesn't get you in trouble with the state because that's civil law, not regulatory law. But the regulatory law does say here that at least what your report must, um, must contain. And you have to follow HIPAA and discuss your patient only with those who have a lawful right to know. And uh, that does not include uh, a roundtable discussion in the uh, office or in, in, in front of the TV sets when there are people around who uh, don't have a, a lawful right to know. And unless you are relating the case as a teaching point, you really have no business talking about it. Now, we all violate that, but uh, just keep in mind that, uh, keep in mind the woman who, uh, the medic who took the picture and, and what happened. Don't do that. Don't don't leak information. Okay, um, you must report elder abuse and child abuse. And that is required by law. And it is not satisfied when you report it to the receiving nurse or physician in the hospital. And I don't care if they promise you that they will call um, Health and Human Services for you. Do not trust them. There is a, an 800 number. You are not off the hook unless you make that call. Elder abuse, the same. Child and elder abuse, both the same. Here in Arizona, it's a felony to uh, fail to report child or elder abuse if your reporting could have headed off further harm to the, to the person. So it's commonly thought that all you need to do is report, it, report your suspicions to the hospital. No, you must report it to the right authority. Um, that, that can be the police. Call a, make a police report or to uh, the, the hotline but you must do it personally. Uh, you must follow your medical director's protocols and stay within the scope of practice. It doesn't matter if you happen to like another service's protocols better. If you work for two different services and they have two different sets of protocols, you have to follow each services set when you're working for them. So if, if one of them has dopamine on the truck and the other one has Levofed, and you happen to prefer Levofed, but uh, you're working at the service where they don't have that now, you can't just bring some with you and <laughs> decide to use it on your own. Uh, even though it, when you're working for the other service, that's what you would do. Um, you must, uh, when you're on duty, you um, must respond if you are dispatched. Now, um, if you're a volunteer and you're not on duty, whether or not you're required to respond doesn't have anything to do with state law or regulations. It has to do with your civil liability and your services rules. If your volunteer service says you are always on call and if possible, you must respond, then you must if it's possible. Um, what about if, if you've had a few drinks? You better not respond. Um, if you're not fit to drive or uh, you're, you're, you are impaired to the point that you can't uh, take care of a patient, um, doesn't matter whether you're a volunteer or not, you have no business driving and taking care of a patient when you're under the influence of alcohol or, or drugs. Um, okay, we've talked about abandonment. Um, if the DSHS asks you for uh, records, you have to supply them. 
if they ask you questions, you have to answer them unless uh, your answer would tend to incriminate you, in which case you still have your Fifth Amendment privilege, but you have to assert that. Uh, you cannot impersonate a higher level of certification. We've talked about that. Um, borrowing medications, um, no. Now, people who are, are addicted to drugs will employ all kinds of devious stunts in order to, um, to uh, uh, get drugs out of the out of the ambulance or the storeroom. One of which is to, uh, if it's a, um, if it's a drug that's in an ampule, they'll take the cap off. They will use a, like a 25 gauge needle, uh, stick it through the rubber uh, grommet and withdraw the drug, replace that with normal saline, and then use just a tiny dab of glue to glue the cap back on it. And you wouldn't notice unless you're re really, really careful. Um, they have uh, basically uh, taken Tubex syringes and um, used the content and then filled them back up with uh, normal saline. Um, so, um, you have to be, uh, it's your responsibility to inspect your drugs carefully. And if you suspect that someone is diverting drugs, you must report it. Um, you just cannot allow a thing like that uh, to happen. Okay, um, once again, uh, anything above a class C misdemeanor has to be uh, reported within five days of uh, five business days, you've got to report uh, your arrest to the uh, DSHS. Now, what is a class C misdemeanor? That's speeding, running a stop sign, um, spitting on the sidewalk, uh, any of those things. That's a class C misdemeanor. You don't have to report those things. But a DWI is not a class C misdemeanor. That's a class A misdemeanor in Texas or worse. And yes, you have to, uh, to do that. Uh, if you uh, refuse to take a drug uh, screening uh, test, that's cause for disciplinary action, even if you quit rather than taking it. If you behave in a disruptive manner to other responders or the public, so don't get in fights with other uh, medics and cops on the scene. Uh, back in the old days, uh, when the funeral homes ran the ambulances, they would race to the scene trying to get uh, to see if anybody was dead and uh, try to get the body, and they would have fist fights over, over uh, who got the dead one. Um, literally, I'm not I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. That that was true. Um, that is thought to be rude today. <laughs> so don't do, don't do those things. <laughs> um, falsifying any document on behalf of yourself or others, uh, services, uh, who, uh, commit Medicare fraud, um, may find themselves a subject of an FBI investigation and, uh, prison sentences, uh, Hasn't been too long since I heard about somebody who got sentenced to seven years in federal prison for uh, Medicare fraud. And I'll give you an example of what uh, Medicare fraud is. For example, uh, some services, it has been stated that if you have only two dialysis patients in your whole company, you can make a million dollars a year. Um, and so it has been a scam for uh, private ambulance services to, um, make lists of people who are uh, dialysis patients and call upon them and offer them money in order to call them for transport. We'll give you $50 every time you call us to transport you to dialysis and back. And uh, that's a, a federal offense. Um, it's all, it will also, it's also a state 
offense and, and, and will cost the, the service or license. If you knowingly go along with that and you're an EMT or, or a paramedic, uh, you may find yourself losing your license and certification as well as and possibly being the subject of federal prosecution. Probably not. You would more likely be a witness. But um, uh, another thing that was done, and you can ask the city of Dallas about this, they had to pay several million dollars back. What they were doing is upgrading patients from BLS to ALS status because you bill more. You, you get paid more for an ALS patient than you do a BLS patient. So some smart somebody said, okay, well, let's just start IVs on everybody, and that makes them an ALS patient. So that's what they, they, they leaned on their medics to do that. And they didn't have it anywhere in writing or anything, but when, uh, when the FBI and CMS started auditing their uh, records, because there happened to be a whistleblower who said, hey, you ought to look at this, uh, they began seeing this pattern. And so then uh, they sent their investigators out and they uh, talked to some uh, medics. And, uh, you know, when the FBI comes and shows you their little badge and said, we'd like to talk to you about some of the stuff that you do uh, for this service. Uh, people are going to squeal like uh, crazy. And um, also, if you find out that your, your uh, employer is doing that, you can file a suit against them called a QUITAM, Q-U-I-T-A-M, a QUITAM suit. And uh, if the government recovers money from them in the form of fines and paybacks, you can get up to 30% of that. And I heard of a medic not too long ago, I think it was last year, who came away with something like $3.3 million um, because of a Quitam suit they filed against the former employer. So um, falsification of records and fraud are no-nos. Um, now, um, Possible outcomes of a complaint, if they close the complaint, that means it's dismissed without any action being taken. Uh, they could issue you a reprimand. They send you a letter saying, now you be good from now on. And you say, okay, I will. Uh, that's as far as it goes. They can suspend you or they can put you on a probated suspension. They can say, okay, you're suspended for a year, but we're gonna probate that for two years and so if you are good for the two years, then you don't have to serve that suspension. But if you mess up between that two year uh, period, then you're gonna have to serve your one year suspension. Or they can revoke you or, or, or uh, take away your license or certification. And we talked about emergency suspension already. Um, and, um, you can recertify after being uh, revoked, but uh, it's difficult. It simply depends upon the facts of the situation and, and a lot of things are taken into consideration. If it is granted, you will come back as a probationary medic. If you have lost your certification because you violated the standard of care, Let's say that you messed up and um, you gave the wrong drug to the patient. You, you meant to give um, atropine, but you gave adenosine instead, and uh, your patient uh, arrested. Um, they might take away your paramedic, and they can say, well, in two years, you can reapply, but we're only going to recertify you as an EMT. That would be one possibility. Um, continuing education providers uh, are governed by this and it, it determines how you become an approved CE provider and the criteria for instruction. Um, and there have to be, um, there's a lot of details to fill out.
uh, for a course to meet one contact hour of education, it has to be at least 50 consecutive minutes of participation in the learning activity. Um, you are responsible for completing your own CE. It is not the responsibility of the EMS service or a regional education provider or even your partner. Oh, I lost my cer certification. It's your fault, partner. You didn't remind me. Uh-uh, won't work. You need to keep your uh, CE certificates and stuff for at least five years in case you're audited by uh, dishes. And um, if you are audited, you have to provide the requested documentation within 30 days. You can ask if you can't find it, etc. and so forth. You can ask for an extension and they're liberal about about doing that. They work with you if, if they know that you're trying, but uh, I would would today what I would do is I would scan all of my certificates and I would keep them not only on my computer but I would have at least two thumb drives with them on there kept in separate places because if my house burns down and it burns down my computer with it then the fact that I've got it on my computer doesn't help so I put a thumb drive over at my sister's house and um, I, therefore, if something happens here, I can go over there and I can uh, retrieve those records. So you can figure out ways to do that, but um, that's that's what to be uh, what you should do. Okay, what cannot you use as CE? Well, you can't use your personal experience or unpublished personal research. Now, if you write an article for the magazine, uh, yes, you get. Uh, I guess you can get an hour. Um, if you're published. Um, you can't take orientation sessions for your new job as CE unless it is in fact CE that that satisfies the CE requirements. Staff meetings that are not providing medical education, uh-uh. Committee involvement, uh-uh. Attending auditing college classes, if you want to take a college class, fine, but you have to take it for, uh, for a grade. And uh, you have to make a grade in it. It has to be on your transcript. Otherwise, you can't take it. And you can't take the same course 10 times. Oh, I just love this course. I'm going to take it for the whole 40 hours or whatever. No, no, can't do that. Um, now, Finally, I want to talk about the Texas Good Samaritan Act. It is not in uh, Chapter 773. It is not in the regulations. It is in the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, the part that deals with medical malpractice suits, liability and tort. So it's Chapter 74 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code. What it says is that, and you can read it, um, a person who in good faith administers emergency care. What does that mean? In good faith. Well, it means that you didn't first uh, hit them over the head with a baseball bat and render them unconscious and take their money and then decide that you ought to help them. Uh, you would not have been uh, administering that care in good faith. It says that if you are in good faith and you emergency uh, and you render care, you're not liable in civil damages. Notice civil damages has nothing to do with criminal or violation of the regulations. I'm talking about you being sued and held liable in a malpractice suit. You're not liable in civil damages for an act performed during the emergency unless the act is willfully or wantonly negligent. Well, what does willful and wanton mean? Willful means you intended to do it. You did it willfully. Wantonly means you were reckless. You didn't care. You were, uh, <laughs> you decided uh, to get drunk before uh, the night before you, um, your shift and you're still drunk when you showed up and uh, 
you're too drunk to drive, but you drive anyway, and your partner allows it, and uh, you uh, run a red light and kill somebody, that's willful and wanton negligence. Also, that is the definition of gross negligence. Different terms used to describe the, th the same thing. Gross negligence is the same thing as willful and wanton negligence. Okay. Specific things that are covered are using an AED. Or if you are a volunteer who is a first responder, as the term is defined under the government code. However, um, this also covers lay people. Uh, and that's what it was intended to cover uh, to begin with, because, you know, until the 1970s, we didn't have such a thing as uh, an EMT or a paramedic. Now, this section does not apply to care administered for or in expectation of remuneration. I don't know why they didn't just say pay, <laughs> because that's what remuneration is. You're being paid for it. So um, <clears throat> that means you can't walk up and say, uh, I see that uh, you cut yourself with a chainsaw and you're bleeding out and I have a tourniquet here and I will be happy to apply that, but you must first pay me $200. Um, and they do, and then you, you, uh, you work on them and everything, and then they decide to sue you. And you say, oh, I'm protected by the uh, Good Samaritan Act. No, you're not. If you do it in expectation of being paid. Well, what about you're at work as an EMT? Are you being paid? Yeah, unless you're a volunteer. So it would seem that according to this, you would not be covered. But never fear. The legislature took care of you, as I'll show you in the next slide. But let's say that you are a doctor uh, or you are a nurse. You are not covered if you do it in expectation of being paid. Now, it's hard to think up a situation where some doctor's driving along and decides to render aid, but only if, if, if you're going to pay him. Or he says, well, I'll bill you, but I'll uh, help you here, but, uh, but you better believe I'm going to bill you. I just don't see that happening. But uh, anyway, that's the language of the statute. Um, <clears throat> It also covers a, a person who is at the scene of the emergency because he's a person he represents as an agent was soliciting business or seeking to perform a service for remuneration. Uh, I tr listen to the police radio and I jump calls and I go and um, uh, solicit business for the uh, chiropractic uh, company that I work for, I'm the chiropractor, and I hand out cards, and at the same time, I happen to render uh, aid to this person. Well, I wasn't there to render aid. I was there to hand out uh, chiropractor's cards, so I cannot rely on the Good Samaritan Act in Texas. It does not cover me because I was there um, soliciting business, okay? Now, let's see what saves us from the uh, in expectation of remuneration. This says, unlicensed medical personnel, that's us. I don't know why they couldn't simply say uh, EMTs and paramedics, emergency medical technicians of whatever level, but they chose to say unlicensed medical personnel. So uh, it really means us. Persons not licensed or certified in the healing arts who are, who in good faith administer emergency care as emergency medical service personnel are not liable, blah, 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 unless the act is willfully or wantonly negligent. This section applies without regard to whether care is provided for or in expectation of remuneration. So you're still covered by the Texas 
Good Samaritan law, even if you are at work when you make the call. However, it only covers you if you are guilty of ordinary negligence, not gross negligence. Well, there is no lawyer that I know of who is not smart enough if he sues you to allege that you were guilty of gross negligence. They will say that your acts constituted willful and wanton negligence. And uh, then uh, you got to prove that, uh, or uh, yeah, you, you got to prove that, that you weren't grossly negligent. And it's kind of hard to say, okay, I was negligent, but only a little bit. I will admit to being ordinarily negligent, but not grossly negligent. So that kind of takes the wind out of the sails of the Good Samaritan law uh, in, in that way. The other thing about it is that it does not automatically protect you. It is a device that you will use if you get sued. What happens is when you get sued, they come, somebody comes and hands you a paper called a uh, citation and, or a, or a uh, subpoena or something like that. It's, it's called a citation in Texas. And that says you are here cited to appear before the honorable blah, 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 and answer to the charges contained in the plaintiff's petition attached here too. And you read that and it says that basically you did every naughty, nasty thing uh, that they can think of and you and you owe them uh, all the money you're ever going to have for the rest of your life. Um, now you say, uh-uh, I am covered by the Good Samaritan Act. Fine, but you have to get a lawyer or if you're smart enough to do it yourself or think you are, uh, you must go and file an answer in court in which you assert that you cannot be found liable because of the protection of the Texas Good Samaritan Act. So it's called an affirmative defense. So you have to go into court and affirmatively file that by filing documents in which you state that. So it doesn't automatically protect you. Well, guess what? We have, um, we have fulfilled the requirements. <laughs> we have uh, done two sections of continuous, I hope we, we can call it education, that took 50 minutes each. So uh, I think we comply for two hours um, credit. Hey, the Gene. There are yeah. some questions over on the right that were coming up while you were talking, but I'm sure you didn't see them. Right. Uh, there's one from Alicia going back to the medical records where you had to keep medical records for uh, minors. Yeah. I that keeping the records until they're 18, is that a Texas requirement or national? Or keeping until they're 21, she meant. No, we discussed that. Okay. I'm sorry. I yeah. guess I was. So you discussed all the questions over here. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry. I was, I was out. <laughs> Alicia, did I, did I cover that for you? Yeah, she said you answered her. Yeah, okay. Okay, sorry, yeah. I missed that. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other, for, any questions now? James, okay. Anthony, James, Logan, are you guys still here? There's Anthony. There's James Pugh. Okay. Okay, you all, uh, if, you, if you attend my chat rooms, you know what my uh, email address is. Uh, but I'll type it for you anyway, because there may be somebody who doesn't, doesn't know it. Um, Sorry, I'm here. This is Logan. Oh, thanks, Logan. I was just making sure people were still here before I give you credit. Oh, that's not it. I'm sorry. Um, that's one of your many. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that the PERCOM one, the other one is not right. Um, 
It's percomonline.com, not percomonline lcom. Oh, oh. That's okay. I think they can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, right. My finger, my fat finger hit the wrong, the wrong button. All right, guys. I have actually already gone and given you uh, the credits. Some of y'all, that's all you needed. Some of you needed the two uh, credits. So I've already posted those. And uh, you still have to go through and do, if you haven't done it, you have to do the quiz that's at the bottom of your course for jurisprudence because Texas law doesn't say you have to take the class. It says you have to take the test. If you have already taken the test for a, your ambulance service and you don't want to do that again, that's fine. They gave you a course completion certificate that you can send to your instructor and he'll give you credit that way and lo log it in the system so that we can make sure it is listed on your course completion certificate when you graduate from paramedic. Okay. Um, now, for those of you who have been in my chat rooms, you know that I do chat every Tuesday at uh, six o'clock Texas time. I also alternate with uh, Rick on the basic chats, which are on Monday at 6.30 Texas time. Um, I will be doing Monday and Tuesday this week, so I invite you to join. And we always talk about some pretty fun things, and um, I hope to see you there. And I will also check with Dr. Frame because he had originally said he might be doing a MD roundtable next Friday, but now that you finished up the entire jurisprudence thing. I don't know if he is planning on it or not, but I'll post it uh, if he is. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gene. Night. Good night. <laughs>